Recording in progress. I call to order this uh, meeting of the Public Safety Committee of the City of Brentwood for July 27th. Um, roll call, please. Alderman Plefka? Here. Alderman Sims? Here. Alderman Lockmiller? Here. Alderman O'Neill? All members are present. Thank you. Has everyone had a chance to look at the uh, agenda? And if so, have there, are there any proposals to change the agenda in any way? Seeing none, the agenda will stand as submitted. We do have an opportunity for citizen comments. We also have one at the end of our meeting, um, number 10, but we are at a point in time for citizen comments. If there's anybody in the audience who wishes to address this committee with regard to an issue of public safety, please identify yourself. You'll be given three minutes. Um, sure. Stopwatch David. starts now. David, David, Dimmitt, yeah, David Dimmitt, 9104 Pine. Uh, I spoke with Alderman Plufka about this on the way over here, and I just wanted to throw out the possibility, the matter that is on the agenda tonight about the, um, uh, the low-speed vehicles, whatever, that, whatever we're calling that thing, uh, and to the extent that you all are considering allowing them to be on our paths, our pedestrian pathways, uh, my only suggestion is if you go forward with that, recommend, with, with that recommendation, um, since it wouldn't be on everyone, every path, as it's proposed right now, there's only, I think, four or five portions of it. Maybe take some steps to indicate to people using that, the pathway pedestrians, um, that there could be carts on here. And it also make it easier for the drivers of the carts to know which pathways are, it's permitted to have them on and which ones it's not permissible. As I'm reading the ordinance, I was very confused. I'm not suggesting it wasn't well drafted. But I had to pull up Google Earth to find out where you could be on the pathway and which ones you couldn't be on. And instead of just signage, maybe uh, what, what came to mind for me are the, um, in some airports, as you're walking, you're trying to get to Concourse B, there's a green painted on the ground. Follow this green trail to get to Concourse B. Follow the red trail to get to Concourse A, et cetera. So if we did something like that for the pathways where uh, the, the low speed vehicles would be permitted, it might be easier for the people driving to say, I know I'm allowed to be on here because this paint is, is on here. Some type of designation other than just signage. Um, so I didn't get a chance to talk to you all beforehand. So I just wanted to throw out that possibility. Something along those lines, again, to alert pedestrians, you're on pathway where golf carts, for instance, are gonna be permitted. So be careful. And number two, the people who are driving those will know for sure we're allowed to be on here. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Anybody online? Uh, there is someone with their hand raised. Okay. Uh, Dan Glass. Dan? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can now, absolutely. Thank you very much, Dan Glass, 8506 Henrietta Avenue on the east side. Uh, I just, I was looking at board docs and looking at the ordinance, and I just wanted to mention that. Um, I noticed that Litzinger Road was going or was suggested to be prohibited. And uh, I just wanted to point out that that is uh, an essential safe crossing point from the east to the west uh, with a light there and is, um, you know, one of the important ways that I am able to get from the east side over to the west side and, and negotiate that section of Brentwood. Otherwise, I'd be be required to go down to White, and of course you know White's chained off, and then if I had to go down to Pine uh, to cross at the light there, I'd, I'd need to cut through the Memorial Park, which I believe is also prohibited in this ordinance. Um, otherwise, I would have to go all the way down to Strassner and cross at that light. So uh, related to the golf cart uh, slow moving vehicle ordinance, I just wanted to point that out. Appreciate your consideration, thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Anybody else? Okay, I'll close public comment and ask for the city administrator's report. Eric, is that you? That is me. Uh, so good evening. Uh, I apologize that I'm not Paul Conde, but I'm happy to be here. Uh, I just want to give a quick update on uh, two things. Uh, the first is the compensation study uh, that is uh, being completed as we talk. Uh, I know that is something that is uh, will be discussed at an upcoming Ways and Means meeting. So we'll be uh, presenting that to Ways and Means shortly. 
In addition to that, uh, the one thing we're going to be doing is a little bit different uh, budget process this year, and we're going to try to bring things to ways and means and, and chunks. And one, and the first thing is personnel, because if there's going to be personnel changes, we want to make sure ways and means either approves or once uh, does not approve with those things, and then if approve it, then we need to you know work on finding the the funding in the budget. So uh, I know last week, or sorry, last month we talked about the three police officers that was being recommended. So that and other uh, positions will be presented to Ways and Means at the August meeting. So just something for Alderman, well, Alderwoman Sims to get excited about. Can't wait. <laughs> uh, just out of curiosity, when is the August meeting for Ways and Means? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, it's the 16th. It has been, so it, the, the regular time has been moved and it is currently set for the 16th at 5.30. Am I correct at that time? Okay, thank you. Eric, anything else? That's it. Thank you. Um, reports of the committee, uh, Chair and Alderman. I, I have just a, not really a report, but just a, 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 a comment. I read, like everybody else, the coverage of um, our first responders um, uh, response to the unprecedented rainfall over the last several days. And um, I, I just want to extend a, uh, a thank you to our fire department and EMS responders and our police department as well, who, um, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's trite to say you, you saved lives, but you saved lives. I mean, you, you, you um, did just fantastic work. And I, I wanted to point out a couple other things too. I've had a number of residents, um, probably between five and ten, um, comment or ask me whether or not the Brentwood bound plan for uh, flood abatement would have changed any of what happened uh, over the last several days. And I told them, I said, you know, it's it's not completed, but we were not planning for an event like this. Th this amount of rainfall was unprecedented. Um, I know Alderman Gould had supplied some information indicating that the that the the gauges in Maplewood were off the scale. They they couldn't even record how high the or how deep the water was, and in Ladue I think it was 20 feet, um, which is almost unheard of for that for that location. Um, so those gauges showed that it was something we have never experienced before. And then I, I read that. This was the most rainfall in a six-hour period that Brentwood or this area has experienced ever since they've been recording rainfall rates. Uh, over eight inches of rain fell within a six-hour period, and overall, I think close to 13 inches fell over the entire event. Um, the next closest uh, rate of rainfall was a un little under seven inches of rain, and that was in 1915, before Brentwood was even Brentwood. Um, so this was unprecedented and um, I don't want people to to believe that that somehow Brentwood bound is going to solve all problems with regard to rainwater and with regard to flooding um, it is designed and it was designed and is being built to um, to, to take care of well more than 95 percent of the rain events that we're going to have going forward um, but it's not designed and nor could it be built to withstand the amount, the volume of rain that fell over the last several days. And wouldn't, I mean, you know, we spent, we've spent $45 million on that aspect of Brentwood Bound alone. We would have had to spend $450 million to, to, to try and, and build up land high enough that it would have contained the amount of water that fell. And I'm not even sure that's, engineering wise, I'm not even sure it's possible. It certainly wasn't recommended by anybody who dealt with this problem when we were planning on how we were going to deal with it. Army Corps of Engineers, SEMA, FEMA, everybody. Um, so I just wanted to say that and I also wanted to extend that um, I'm uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, I find myself really impressed with the, the training and the execution of our, our uh, employees, our public servants and, and our safety officers especially. And so uh, I just wanted to share that with you. So thank you very much. Um, Alderman Sims. Um, I just wanted to echo Alderman Plufka's uh, gratitude to our first responders, police and fire. I mean, the expertise, the heroism, you know, the responsiveness. I mean, in, in this unprecedented flood was really impressive. I mean, I, the, 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 the feedback I got alone, um, you know, I certainly don't deserve it. You all were out, were out you know, 
saving lives, but we really thank you. We're grateful for you. We're grateful for your expertise. So um, just really, you're, you're heroes in my book. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Lockmiller. I too would like to extend my thanks and to the, thank the municipalities around us that came to help. When I was driving around down there that day, I saw Clayton, Richmond Heights, I'm sure Maple was probably involved. So I'd like to thank them and the rest of our staff too, because I know public works, parks, and there's a lot of work ahead of us in cleaning up what we've got down there. So I'd like to just thank staff as a whole. Thank you. Alderman O'Deal. All right. A comment that on social media with pictures and text, everything was positive. People are saying good things about us. What a lot of people are commenting on was the animal rescue. No one had thought about that. <laughs> and, and the number of dogs that were removed was fine. The question came up, were there cats? <laughs> and I don't know, but, but you are getting accolades for that. Um, that were totally unexpected. So thank you for all of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Um, we have department reports starting with our <clears throat> police department. Thank you, sir. Uh, just to reiterate what all of you said, we, uh, we're very proud to partner with our fire department. Uh, their leadership on this last week was outstanding, and I'll embarrass these two behind me. Uh, Police department folks did a great job too. They were like little wet rats when it was over, but really this was uh, uh, led by our fire department. They did a great job, so we appreciate their work. In regard to the police report, um, I, I typically start off with our, our crime report and I'll do that as well, but I wanted to hit on something that's been over the last three weeks, uh, rearing its ugly head again, and that's car break-ins. And most of these are happening in the, in the nighttime hours um, and I'll discuss briefly about the kind of break-ins that we're seeing. There have been 23 incidents, and when I say incidents, I'm, this doesn't necessarily mean just 23 cars. These are 23 independent incidents of people breaking into cars in Brentwood in the last month. That's a lot for us. Uh, they're really split into different areas. Uh, the most common one that we're seeing is cars that are uh, multiple cars parked in areas at night. So think parking garages, think hotel lots. Um, snooks lots of people that are working. Our target lot with the employees got hit. Uh, about 20 vehicles on the 12th of July got hit. Uh, and they're looking for the same things. It's a little different as well. They are not looking for vehicles that are open and rummaging through them. These are broken windows. So they're smashing windows in that scenario at night at businesses and hotels. And it's not just Brentwood. This is going on all over the area. There's a particular crew that we have identified that our detectives are aware of uh, working with other uh, municipalities and cities that these, that crew has affected, and it's a lot. Uh, there are people out wanted for much of, of that nighttime crime at this point, uh, but there's plenty of crews doing this. This is not just clean up one crew and you're gonna solve this issue. Uh, there's a lot of people doing it. We have seen uh, what are, in my opinion, are even scarier events of them coming into our neighborhoods and into our uh, driveways. Uh, they are very, very clearly well armed. You can see it in many of the videos. Uh, we have seen multiple incidents that have occurred up in the Brentwood Forest area recently. So we've directed our patrols up into that area at night. Um, but it's, again, these are all the really the same type of people that are doing the crime, but they're different groups of folks doing it. Uh, right now, our detectives are part of a task force that works with St. Louis City and County and all the municipalities. Uh, they have a running spreadsheet that's up to uh, hundreds of people that are on this list. There's well over 200 now. So, uh, and these are just the people that we know, right? These are the folks that are being identified through fingerprints and DNA evidence out of stolen cars. There are people that are caught and arrested. There, there are people on Facebook and things like that where they're bragging in social media and showing themselves on social media and saying what they're doing. Uh, so that's how we're identifying these different groups, but uh, there's a lot of them at this point doing it. Another thing that's really driving this crime right now is uh, Kias and Hyundais, you probably have seen it in the news. They've become very easy to steal for those cars that are without, uh, that you need a key to start. Uh, they have figured out how to use a USB cord, peel the column, shove that cord into the electrical part of the ignition system and the car starts. 
they figured it out. And we are getting a ton of Hyundais and, and Kias stolen in the St. Louis area. Uh, just last night, there were four of them chased in Central County. Uh, we have to let those cars go. Our pursuit policy does not allow us to chase them. These are the same, it's the same people that are doing these crimes that we're seeing in videos, armed with guns. I've preached this over and over to all of you and to our citizens that they're very dangerous. I personally don't see how we can call these personal property crimes anymore. This, to me, is more, much more of a violent crime issue. Uh, they have hurt enough people, and they are going to continue to do what they're doing. Not only uh, innocent people, but police officers as well are extremely at risk with these folks. And we have plenty of videos that back up the, the fact that they're armed. One of the things that's going on, and in, in, in I think it's kind of a syndrome in, in law enforcement, we're pushing these people to other cities, right? So just as an example, last week, there were a bunch of car cloudings in Richmond Heights. They lined up three marked police vehicles to combat it. Clayton got hit the next night with multiple car cloudings. We're really good at pushing. If, we, you know, if it doesn't happen in Brentwood, we're, we're happy with that. Well, it's just completely ineffective. Uh, so we're really looking at trying to come up with an approach that's, that's better. Uh, what can we do to affect this area-wide, right? So. Uh, we could set up a task force kind of environment where officers are assigned in Brentwood out of our Brentwood Police Department. We frankly just don't have enough people to really do it effectively. Uh, we can do it. It's, it's going to be more of a, a quick hit kind of thing to get them out of town, so to speak. The next step would have been to go to our neighboring departments. So, you know, Maplewood, Richmond Heights will do, and Clayton. Um, Webster Groves has been affected by this greatly recently. I reached out to the chiefs. They've reached out to their elected officials. I do not think there's a, um, I don't think we'll see that happen anytime soon. Um, there there is, really isn't an appetite for what potentially could happen on the backside of those kind of task forces. Uh, these guys don't stop. They are well armed and there, are, there will be confrontations on the backside of these kind of stops. And so the, the willingness to participate in a task force is not there at this point. So then there's another step beyond that, and that would be uh, St. Louis County Police Department taking the lead for an area-wide task force. And that's really, in my opinion, that, that's really uh, what we need to do. I think that would be the most effective approach. But there are a lot of moving parts to get that done. Uh, county's got, <laughs> the county police department has to agree to it and participate and direct it and control it. Uh, and then you have to have buy-in from the municipality police departments and the elected officials in order to be able to staff it because you need a lot of people to do it. So we are having conversations with the county about it. I don't know where it'll lead. I just wanted to advise you that we are talking about it. In my personal opinion, I think that would be the most effective way to do it is to put together a large task force modeled after what the St. Louis City has done with their anti-crime task force, which is more of a surreptitious way to, to address these folks. It becomes more of a challenge at three in the morning than it is at three in the afternoon, but it can still be done. So uh, it's something we're looking at as we go forward. Uh, the last thing on the crime report, really outside of that, much of what's in the last month is, is retail crime. Uh, but one thing I did want to mention to you, I don't know if you've, you've heard about this uh, incident yesterday at Alta. Uh, it's all on video. It's, uh, it's a little scary. Their uh, cars show up, and we have 11 people that go into Alta. And they, it's a flash mob kind of environment masked up, and they just descend on Alta and steal everything that they, they wanted to steal last night. Uh, got back in their cars and fled. They were in and out of there in less than two minutes. Um, by the time we got there, which was shortly after they left, uh, they're gone already. So um, it's, it's kind of scary that they're that bold. And we we're seeing it nationwide, but it's here now as well. So they stole about $14,000 worth of product within two minutes out of their shelves. So there's, they'll be back. They did the same thing Monday at an Alta in another location in South County. Just wanted to give you a quick update on, on two other things. Um, it, as you all know, we've been in the CALEA process. We were uh, certified in 2019 by CALEA um, and accredited at that point. Over the, those following years now, Kalia never goes away. It's with us every day of our lives. And this year now was the point where Kalia comes back to us and says, after a review, do you, are you accredited again for this period? We received that uh, yesterday. I received it as the chief here in Brentwood. 
uh, we have been accredited again, thanks to the lion's share of great work by Jim McIntyre and Kevin Bosher. Uh, they drive our CALEA accreditation process on a daily basis. That doesn't mean the rest of, of us, myself included, unfortunately, aren't involved in the process. It really, truly is a, a police or department-wide effort. Everyone's got to kick in in different ways, whether it be proofs or whatever, whatever it may be. So um, next year will be, all of this was done offsite, meaning they, they look at all our policies. We, uh, we provide proofs to them, hundreds of proofs to them over that period of time that they review. Uh, next year, they come in person again. So we will see the CALEA inspections uh, here next year in person as part of the whole process. So next year will be a recertification in person for us. The last thing I was gonna mention, and uh, uh, Ronnie and I and, and Bola have had extended conversations about the, the Motorola radios that, that both police and fire are using are coming to their, they're becoming extinct or coming to their end life. This is a very big cost project for both departments. And we're working with Ronnie and Ed to try and make sure that, and I don't mean to speak for them, I could certainly speak to this as well, but we're trying to do this uh, in conjunction uh, with each other and to get the best price and, and look at what our options are. One of the options that I like is a lease program so that we don't have this big bang of, of cost coming at us. And it's a lot of money to, to redo our radio system. So uh, we're probably looking somewhere in the area of about $850,000. Um, yeah, so it, it's expensive. They're, the radios that we have are working very well, and uh, I don't I don't consider them extinct. So we we might be looking at extending the use of those radios. We do have a warranty on them for this year. Uh, so just giving you a heads up on this, it's coming down the pike. At some point, we're going to have to get into an arrangement where we redo the radios. But uh, we continue to look at it. Eric's been part of that. Robin's been part of it. Um, so we're, we're trying to come up with the best solution to that. Anybody have any questions for me? Questions from the committee? Go ahead. Yes, sir. It's not pretty. Um, these groups have to go back somewhere. They reside in some part of the county or the city. I mean, is there any, would this task force take it to them as far as, you know, finding out where they live and rounding them up there? Yeah, it, it becomes a little complicated when you, you have to have evidence in order to arrest them, right? So the, the, that becomes the challenge here. Often they, they flee and get away, and we, we, we don't have evidence to, to prove that they're doing it. Um, sometimes we don't have um, violent crime, and again, it's considered a property crime at this point. So prosecutions and, and subsequent sentencing and things like that aren't, aren't as powerful as we would hope that they'd be. So, or, but to answer your question, oftentimes uh, a task force can do that. Yeah, they can focus on the groups that they've identified and then do surveillance on them and other, and other ways to make cases on them. Um, you had an organized group of people that were addressing it. It becomes much more efficient and effective in terms of prosecution. So. And they can cross municipal lines as far as. Right. Thanks. Yes, they would be able to, to uh, working together, they would be deputized to go anywhere in, in St. Louis County to be able to, to do their job, yes. Um, I just have a, uh, two or three, I guess. Uh, any thought to any tweaks to the pursuit policy? We had a meeting uh, with Bola and uh, Peter Dunn, who's an, an attorney that's dealt with pursuit policy litigation and for a long time. And uh, so what we're considering uh, bringing to, to you as the elected officials is an adjustment to the pursuit policy. And really what we're asking for is not to open up the pursuit policy, at least not at this point by any means, but there's a gap of time when an officer gets behind a car and they run. Uh, these, these people doing this type of crime, they're, they're not even waiting for a policeman to turn on their lights, right? They, as soon as a, a police car gets behind them, they, they will take off, especially in the middle of the night. So there's a gap of time there between the officer being able to obtain the plate on the car, call it into the dispatching center, and then the dispatcher returning that plate information to the officer. Some of these cars, and it doesn't happen that frequently, but some of the cars are wanted for violent crime. Uh, might be taken in a carjacking or involved in a shooting, whatever it may be. That would authorize a pursuit under our rules, and then that's the, the 
officer and his super, her supervisors would make that decision based on, on what they know from the, the broadcast. But there's a gap of time there that, that was probably a minute or two in which the officer, in order to do that, has to stay with the car. Well, that technically is a, is a pursuit in, in terms of the minute or two it takes to get the return from the, from the license plate information. So what, we would, what we're considering asking to do is, is relax that pursuit policy, at least giving them an opportunity to, to run the plate. The other thing that happens in two minutes in Brentwood is they're probably out of town. So it, that's, that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing, right? So it does lend itself to what I spoke to earlier, of we're, we're just chasing them into other cities and they go do their thing there. But uh, you know, at this point we get paid to protect Brentwood, so running them out of Brentwood is a good thing. I'm not gonna argue that, so. But that's, that's really the adjustment we were looking for. And when you talked about uh, the options as to the response, um, the third option you talked about was a St. Louis County-led response. In your opinion, just in your opinion, would that change that political appetite to some extent? It's, I think it will, yes, and it should. Uh, St. Louis County would take the lead on the supervision of that team of right. people. And that, that I've, I've just, you know, we really are just in the beginning stages of talking to the county. I have a, a meeting with a colonel tomorrow that's in charge of that bureau. Uh, Chief Gregory has, to my knowledge, hasn't had any conversations about it at this point. So. Uh, it's kind of, it, it's early in this process. I do think that the first part of the process has to be St. Louis County accepting that role and that responsibility of a task force lead. They've done it in other, they do it in our drug investigations, right? So municipalities give St. Louis County officers to do drug cases. Uh, there is a group of municipal and county officers that, that work as a task force for drugs. Right. There's uh, other task forces, think of the major case squad, for example, that county and municipal officers work together on. Uh, we're gonna hear a little bit later on about the academy and, and what role the municipal officers play there. They're all under uh, memorandums of understanding um, and it's clearly defined on who's in charge and how, how the process is gonna work. But yes, I think it would alleviate some of that. Uh, will the municipalities give people up to do it? I, I, that's part of the, of the equation. So my, my last question was it had to do with the radios. Is there any way to spread out that purchase into stages or does it interfere with your ability to communicate if you're? No, we could and that's, and I was speaking toward a, uh, a lease process. So we could lease these radios depending on how this goes. Uh, they do offer a lease option over a number of years. Okay. So we could pay for them and I think we could enter that lease option like really a rent think, to own kind of thing. Yeah, I think it might. Yeah, it could be up to five years. Might even be more than that. But the the lifespan of the radios right now are seven years. That's what we're sitting on now. These radios are um, end of life at seven, and that's where we are. So it might be a seven year lease process. Okay. All right. Thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions? Thank, Thank you, Chief. Fire department. All right. Good evening. <clears throat> Uh, first, I appreciate the kind words uh, that were said at the beginning. Our folks did some amazing work, um, one after another. So I'm very proud of our department and their professionalism and um, just they stayed the course yesterday. It was a very long day and um, they stayed the course. So I really appreciate you recognizing them. Uh, I'll start just to give an overview of my um, department update that I provided and then I have just a couple highlights from yesterday that I'll share. Uh, so with our ISO assessment, uh, the assistant chief, our battalion chief of training and myself met with them um, at the beginning of July. It was a very good meeting. Um, things went really well. Unfortunately, he said it could take up to six months before we have our new, our updated rating, but um, we're hopeful by the end of the year um, we'll know what that, that rating is. So it was, it was very encouraging. Our hiring process is complete and we did extend the offer. Um, the gentleman accepted the offer. He graduated the fire academy last evening. Unfortunately, I couldn't attend. <laughs> a little bit busy, but uh, we're excited. He, he's gonna start um, in just a couple of weeks in August. So um, that we need him, <laughs> we really need him. Uh, ambulance um, repairs, I, I just wanna highlight this because you may have seen uh, an ambulance with 
the city of Ladue on the side of it, responding to a lot of calls in Brentwood lately. We've been having to borrow an ambulance from them due to some maintenance issues with our ambulance. So they graciously loaned it to us. Um, we did not miss any calls because of the unit being out of service. It just wasn't a Brentwood sign on the side of that ambulance. So it was our, our paramedics, our equipment. So um, we've worked through that now. That ambulance has been returned. Um, our 2021 ambulance is back in service. The warranty work has been completed and we're finishing up the work on our 2012. We're waiting on parts. Um, they've been ordered, so it, you know, we're just hung up on that. Uh, this next item, I'm, I'm really excited to be sharing with you all tonight. So last budget cycle, we advocated to expand um, some expenditures for professional development. And this firefighter has, he's a hard charger at all times, um, but this is really neat um, for him. He just completed uh, his undergrad degree in uh, fire administration. Um, he just received his diploma, and I think it was about a week apart, he was also accepted into the National Fire Academy's Managing Officer Program. So that's a multiple year program on campus um, in Emmitsburg, Maryland. It's a big deal for our department. Um, very excited for him. This is developing our next leaders on the gov federal government's dime. So uh, he's, he's getting some great education and experience. Um, essentially at the National Fire Academy, we pay for his meals. So um, this is very encouraging. Um, on the EMS billing, uh, I just wanted to highlight, um, we started the process this week for Missouri GEMT for our next reimbursement cycle. Our EMS provider, our billing provider, EMS MC, is hosting a billing conference. It's been canceled due to COVID. Brentwood's never attended, but since we're participating in GEMT, I'm gonna attend this in September. It's in North Carolina. Uh, only have to pay for the hotel expense. Um, however, it, it will cause me to miss the September meeting. So I, I just wanted to, to share that information. My apologies, but it, it's gonna be a valuable information. Just help us stay on top of the trends for ambulance billing. Do you have any questions? I, um, I'd like to highlight some information that you don't have just based off yesterday's uh, call totals. Okay, uh, any questions from the committee? No? no. Thank you. Okay. Please continue. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, we're still digging into the call totals. Uh, just to put it in perspective, we had our, the first flood call came in to Brentwood. So I set up a command post in Brentwood in Hanley Industrial Court about 3.15 um, yesterday morning. Once that happened, all the flood calls for this region came through my command post. So I was dispatching units to Maplewood, Rock Hill, uh, Richmond Heights, so Webster Groves, the region. Uh, it's just a command and control structure and setup. So we're still looking through all the data. Uh, there's a lot, I don't know, for calls for service. Most were not in Brentwood. So the calls for service in Brentwood I believe, because we're, we're still digging on it, for flood related um, was 18 calls. We ran 26 calls in total yesterday, but 18 were directly related to uh, flood calls. Um, we did rescue and evacuate, so combine the two numbers, of evacuating from buildings and rescues from floodwaters, right at 50 people and 47 dogs. The dogs were from two separate facilities. Um, it, it took us a little time to get to the dogs, um, but it was calculated. We, we were getting people out of moving water before we moved to the dogs, which were in buildings. And once we got the proper resources to Alderman Lock Miller's point, um, we had boats from Valley Park, uh, a boat from Union, Missouri, and at about 10.30 yesterday morning, we had a boat show up from Cape Girardeau that was assigned to assist us. And uh, so, yeah, we had some great help. Um, we're still continuing our assessments of damage. Um, we have to uh, report that 
to the county uh, emergency operations center. They in turn communicate that up the chain to SEMA and FEMA. So that's ongoing. It's going to be ongoing for a little bit, a few days. Any questions on the flood? Yeah, point you're just making at the end there. So in order to get designated a federal disaster and get federal funds, those numbers have to be calculated as to damages. Correct. And that's what gets fed up the Correct. chain before Correct. we can get that yep. any disaster relief. That process started. We we were declared, well, I shouldn't say that. The state authorized state assets yesterday morning, probably around 6.30 in the morning. Um, so that gave us more resources to help with the emergency. And correct, to your point, we're just waiting for the president to sign the declaration at this point. So I, I saw in the news where they were saying that you, through the United Way that you could dial 211 and business owners could report their losses. Correct. But then are you also calculating their losses? Yes. And then yes. Okay. We're calculating the damage to the building. Just the building yeah, itself. Yeah, contents, okay. um, we're not focused on that. It's the structure, is the structure safe? Um, what needs to happen in that building for them to be able to reopen? Thank you. Yes. I, I apologize, I didn't have it prepared either. I just want to tail on to what Chief Spee said about the radios. Um, I think the best analogy, the way it was explained to me, it's just like our cell phones. It, they're given a lifespan. Your phone may work just fine, but we've already been given communication by Motorola. If we have a radio break, they may return it unfixed because they, they're not making parts for our radios anymore. So it's rather urgent for us, but it, we're working through the process uh, right now. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Dan? Public Works. All right, got a couple quick items here. Uh, the York Village Solar Street Lights, I'm sure you've seen the, put the uh, forms in. We have every intention of pouring concrete on Tuesday, and that didn't happen. So whenever those dry out, I know we looked at the forms, there's still water within the forms. I would assume it would dry out sometime this week, and then we should be able to pour the concrete next week. But, you know, at least the augers were used, the tubes are in there, the steel's in there, just a matter of pouring them, letting them cure, and then putting the lights up. And then on Manchester Road, we had our meeting with KCI, and that's, I'm sure, going to change as well. But at the Monday meeting, they were saying that the closure east of Hanley Road on eastbound Manchester was about another two weeks of closure. So that would take you through August 8th, but that was before the flooding, and I know that some of that pipe work has to be cleaned out and assessed before they continue on with it. So I would think that that date will kick out a little bit, maybe a week. And then uh, Brentwood Bound, I mean, uh, yeah, Brentwood Boulevard, rather, at Strassner, um, that wet spot, we actually went out there with MSD at the same time and inspected those pipes. So whenever we were feeding our camera through the lateral, it enters a trunk line, which is their pipe. The only trouble is when they're putting their camera through the trunk line, the two don't see each other. So what we think is that the um, sewer lateral that's on 2010 is on an abandoned pipe and that their trunk line, which you can see flow through there, so like mobile on the run and, and folks upstream, the waste is going down the pipe, it's still an active line. <laughs> so the thought process is that they need to dig up the lateral for this um, resident and actually tie them onto their trunk line because what's happening is the abandoned trunk line fills up it backs up into the lateral it doesn't back up into the home it just builds up enough pressure head that it goes down through cracks and goes and pools right there and deteriorates the pavement so hopefully you know msd will dig that up and fix it when it is fixed then i would assume that they would go down and make that patch or it would be st louis county but the county's been pretty good at filling that every time it starts deteriorating and falling in, they fill it. But, you know, I'm just worried that if it takes too long that you're just going to have this wet, spongy mess and just keep feeding more mater materials on top of it. So at least we know that it's not what we thought, which was that they were on the same pipe. They're two separate pipes. You know, the cameras should have seen each other. It's like we put in, I don't know what it was, like 40, 50 feet of camera, and we can see that we're in the trunk. 
they're in their trunk and the two should be looking at each other and they're not. So, and then as far as uh, traffic calming, I'm sure most are aware that like near 8518 Eulalie, that block basically like Mary Kay to Helen, uh, we put in a traffic calming device. So there's speed cushions there, just like you've seen speed cushions on Pine and Rosalie, you know, on a temporary basis. Um, we did traffic counts there. The counts, of course, with Manchester being closed are significantly higher. You're seeing like 2,000 vehicles a day. You know, the good news is even without the speed cushions, the number of um, speeders was about 1%. So 1% of that 2,000 is actually a really low number. But just, you know, belt and suspenders to keep people going even slower, you know, these are put in. And, you know, we can put the data collector up there and see if it's had a, another effect, if it's reduced it even further. But, you know, it wasn't a bad condition. This has made it a little bit better. And at least, you know, psychologically, I'm sure everybody sees it and believes that it's helping. I thought the counts were 28,000, not 2,000. No, it was in the twos, like 2,700 at most, I think. Yeah, 28,000 would be huge. 28,000 would be like McKnight. Right. Yeah, this should be in the twos. Okay. So the traffic analysis report for 8505 Eulalie? Right. Yeah, it should be like 2,000. Okay. It just says... There, there's probably over 20 in that uh, range. Oh, you know, I see. But so the average daily, the mean, ADT is what I'm It doesn't mean total vehicles to. per day. It just means total vehicles. Right. Yeah, the ADT is the average daily traffic. That's about 2,000. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, that scared me there. I was like, whoa, there's way too many cars. Um, and then uh, switching gears to uh, Lawn Avenue, the data collector was up there, and this would be the block between High School and Brentwood Boulevard. So I didn't put the um, synopsis in here, but I can put it in the weekly report. But we're seeing like 460 cars a day. But of that 460, I'm seeing 10 to 15% that are violators, meaning they're going 10 miles per hour or more over the speed limit, which is posted at 20. So that 10% to 15% of that 460 is significantly worse than, say, over at Eulalie. You know, put it in perspective, you know, there's way more, you know, say 40, 50, 60 cars in a given day that are doing 30, 31. When you look at that 85th percentile speed, it's 30 miles per hour. So that's 85% of that group of cars is doing 30 miles per hour or less, but then you've got that 15%, which is going more than 30, say 31 and up. That's one of the other criteria I look at, so I don't like that number. So we do have speed cushions. We had bought three sets, so one set's deployed here in Eulalie, and we have enough in that um, set that we could put two more sets just like we did on Pine because it's the same length block as what's on Lawn. So if we do that, it's probably just going to push people on the white or some other east-west avenue. But, you know, it does fit a lot of the criteria and checks the boxes for deploying something there on lawn. Okay. So are you asking for some recommendation from the committee as to deployment of additional speed? If you want us to, we can. I mean, we have it. And I don't know if there's any other areas that are worse that you would save them. I know it took us a while to get these, but they'll fit any street that's about 24 to 26 feet from curb face to curb face. Okay. And that would fit there. Is there any thought on the committee about deploying additional? I'll, I'll react okay. because I've used lawn for years. It's closer to my condo than some of the other things. And I frankly don't see all that much traffic. Correct. So I would be against speed cushions anywhere on the street there if you had to put them down one rather than two. Most of the time if I go down there and there's another car on the street, it's a resident turning into their driveway. Mm -hmm. So even though some of us in Brentwood Forest use it rather than pine or whatever else comes up and in Renwood's in the wrong direction, I don't see it as that big a problem. I'm surprised at the numbers of people going that fast because I don't see it. So I, I, on a personal note, would not be happy to see anything on that street. Well, the citizens submitted a petition. They did. It, and it met the criteria. Yeah, they received the two-thirds signatures. And like I said, the volume, I wish it were higher. But you know, of that volume, which is not quite 500 cars a day, it's like there's a, a decent amount that are speeding. 
and it's a long block. I mean, if you look at it, it's the same length as Pine. It's, it's the same side streets. But we don't have a traffic. We don't have a criteria for the amount of traffic. Usually, rule of thumb is you want it closer to a thousand vehicles per day. So this is no. a lower volume. I mean, everything is kind of fluid when you're looking at it. You're looking at site distance, distance, you know, to a school or some other special, you know, area. 85th percentile speed is the number I was looking at too. You know, the one over on um, Eulalie, the 85th percentile speed was 24 miles per hour. That's about where it should be. You should be no greater than say five miles per hour over the posted speed limit for 85% of the cars. And this one's at 30 miles per hour. So, but we can uh, submit the re full report if you want to look at it further before we do anything. Is that what you would like? If that makes right. more sense. I have another question. Go ahead. Time of day, does that make a difference? Is this rush hour morning and evening that more of the speeding occurs? Correct, yeah, because um, the, the two reports I added don't show it, but I can throw that in there. But there's actually graphs that you can do too, and to your point, it'll show like the hours in military time, and then you'll see graphically where you're, you have your peaks. So like at 2 a.m., you're not gonna see really anything anywhere in this town. But at say like 6 a.m., 7 a.m., it's like you'll see a big spike where people are leaving their driveways, going to work, whatever. And then all of a sudden you'll see speeding throughout that say two hour window and then it goes down and then it picks up at lunch and goes down and, and usually by 5 p.m. It, it stays from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. where people are speeding. Yeah, can we have, so. do we think we can have the full report by the August meeting? Oh yeah. Meeting? Okay. Terrific. Yep, I can do Thank that. Thank you very much. Yep. Go ahead, I have a yeah, please go ahead. Did we lose any equipment in the flood down there at the- Thankfully, airport? no, I, I know, well, the only thing uh, we, we lost, which really was a secondhand thing to us, was one of those big shop coolers. We actually got it from Brentwood Plastics, and it had flooded there, but our mechanic got it working. And then when we had a lot of heat, we gave it to Bowser House to use to help cool the garage while Reinhold switched that um, overhead supply to the three-phase. And they used it, and then they, I just figured while it's so hot, you know, just let them keep it, and then we'll just come get it later. So that went underwater yesterday, but we think we can retrieve it and clean it up again. If we can't, it didn't really cost us anything but two spare parts. And we have one just like it at the shop that we didn't give them, but. And then regarding Bowser House, since we're the owners of that facility, what what's going to happen to it? Is it? We talked a little bit today. Yeah, I can take this one. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we, the fire chief, uh, the fire marshal, I'm sorry, and the inspector went through uh, Bowser House, and right now they've declared it inhabitable. Uh, so we have reached out to Bowser House to let them know. Uh, we will continue to work with the inspector to see what needs to be done and see if it's something that we can uh, fix or if it's something that the city wants to fix or figure out alternate, uh, an alternate plan. So that's where we're at right now. And uh, we, I'd let her know that we continue to give her updates as we have them. One last thing. Um, a while ago, we passed, or we were forward onto the full board, the removal of a parking, no parking sign on high school. Is that legislation coming? Yeah, I'm working with Kevin to send that on to the full board since it was passed at this okay. committee. So right. that will be coming up. And then the only other thing I was gonna add is the other thing that was damaged is that decorative fence that's on top of, or it's on the north side of Litzinger over the creek, you know, just west of Hanley, that bridge that goes over Black Creek. And then I think that was pretty much it, because, oh, and then uh, someone hit another Strassner light, so now we're missing two lights. So you got the one that's leaning over, and then Monday a Dodge Charger, I guess, was flying along and hit that light and sent it flying like 30, 40 feet, and it's in pieces and destroyed, so. Now we got two out of the five to replace. I might just take the other three down, that way there's no more targets, but <laughs> hopefully we can get them working. But that's it. Yes, Lori. Oh, sorry. Is there any estimate on when, I mean, I drive by that every day to get to my house. Is there any estimate on when that's gonna be done or? Yeah, and the first one, I know the insurance deductible is 5,000 and the light itself was like 12 and we need to order it, so we're waiting for insurance to give us the go ahead to go ahead and place the order. 
So we have two quotes, and then I said, well, since this other one got hit Monday, can I have Meyer, since they were the lowest quote, order a second light, and we'll keep a second claim out on it. Since this guy hit it, I would think we wouldn't have to pay the deductible, or we'd at least be reimbursed our deductible, you know, if we proceed with that. The other one, no one knew who hit it, but this was obvious because the police were there and filled out a police report. So. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right. Uh, Next on the agenda is the consent agenda, and that consists of the meeting minutes. Everybody had an opportunity to review the minutes. Are there any additions or redactions? Seeing none, the minutes will stand as submitted. Under old business, we have the first item is a scooter ordinance. Um, do you want to introduce this for us, Eric? Yeah, so at the last public uh, safety committee meeting, we talked about uh, the possible bringing of scooters to the city of Brentwood as part of the agreement that we have, the intergovernmental agreement. And uh, after some discussion, I think the committee requested uh, a ordinance to be written and, uh, and uh, brought forth to the committee. Uh, we have done so. We, we, you know, we looked at a lot of scooter ordinances around St. Louis, St. Charles, and across the country as well as kind of talked about uh, incorporated things that were discussed at the last meeting. So uh, attached, is the, or attached was the uh, new chapter, chapter 377. It didn't really seem to fit anywhere else, so a new chapter seemed the best uh, course of action. Okay. Um, so uh, let's open it up for discussion. Did anybody get a chance to review the uh, proposed um, ordinance chapter 377 and I please I have a question just to for probably more emphasis rather than uh, clarification so these scooters there it looks like they're they can go from what the maple trail which runs from Strassner Drive to Rogers Parkway um, and then nowhere else I mean they're not allowed on our trail system is really what I'm getting at no I mean, based on the conversation we had uh, last meeting, it seemed like the committee did not want scooters on any trail, so I kept that. The Maple Trail, would, you know, the reason for the Maple Trail is that's the connection to the Great Rivers Greenway when that project is done, all the way into the uh, promenade. So that would seem to make sense if, if part of the reason to bring scooters is transportation, allowing people to get from, you know, get to important places within Brentwood. That would be probably one of the better ways of to do it. So they would be allowed on that section of the GRG? Correct. Whatever. Right, it, it, uh, the, the way that section is written, oh, and I know, it, it prohibits it except when there's an exception. So it's kind of backwards in the, as you read it. Any other? I have a couple questions. Yeah. One's a maintenance question. I mean, I realize these have an electronic component, but how, how quickly does the company say they will respond when they learn that one of these is out of commission? Give me one second. Uh, I'll try to bring that. I forgot to pull that up with me. One second, I'll pull that up if I, I can try to answer your other question while I'm doing that. Well, you can do ballpark figure would be fine. It, I think it's 72 hours. So I think, you know, any any time, well, actually, I mean, they're supposed to have a 24 hour hotline that we can contact them at any time. Um, the 72 hours might be if a, if a scooter is in a single location for more than 72 hours, they're required to come, remove it, and figure out what's going on. Um, the current uh, company has. Um, multiple vendors within the St. Louis company that their job is to come through and move scooters, put them in the right places, and then um, provide maintenance on them. Uh, so if I start with 72 and I'll look and make sure that's right. So, so it's not immediate, obviously. Are there any records of what this company has actually done in other cities in terms of response time? I could ask that. I, I do not have that data. That's not something that we asked as part of the permit. 
I think, based on what I've seen in other cities, if the response time isn't immediate, these things sit there and decorate the sidewalks or a corner or something for days, they don't get moved. Um, it's not an attractive sort of addition to the city. So aside from the danger of them, I'm a little concerned that we don't have a way for them to come and, and remove them. If they're doing 100 distributed here, this, this can be a lot. I have a question for you, Eric. Um, under the definitional section 020, it says that the vehicle will not be allowed to be operated at a speed greater than 25 miles an hour. And then number 12, I think it is, at the bottom of section 090, it shall not be operated at a speed of greater than 15 miles an hour. And I'm just was curious as to whether you saw that as maybe a a conflict or whether it's just what the thing's capable of and then what it will be operated at. I, uh, I believe is uh, city attorney O'Keefe likes to call that Scribner's error. Okay. Uh, so that's probably my, my fault. So most places I saw was uh, 15, or I'm sorry, 25 miles an hour. Okay. Um, so doesn't the, mean we can't ask for something a little bit lower. So, so 12 in your mind probably is the part that needs to be changed. Correct. Okay. Is Anybody else have any questions or concerns? Well, I mean, what are your thoughts about this? It, 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 does somebody want to entertain, or does the chair will entertain a motion to bring this to the full board of aldermen uh, if somebody's inclined to make that motion? I'm, I'm a little ambivalent, but I'll make the motion to open it up to the And I'll second board. it if it's okay, if, if I can do that. I'll second it just to get the conversation started. Um, so looking at this, I mean, I, I will just tell you my, I have worked in downtown St. Louis since 1987, and these things came on the scene uh, a while back. Um, the city is now, the city of St. Louis has now prohibited them. Um, and it's not so much for the, the, I, the, the appearance of it, you know, them at intersections in clumps and things like that. It is... Um, it's more for their operation. They are, um, I, I know from my own personal experience is that in Keener Plaza, I've seen accidents. I've seen people racing them. I've seen, you know, things like that going on. It's mostly kids. It's mostly younger kids riding them. Um, the way that they're able to engage them is with the use of an app and, um, they're designed to be, you know, one direction. I mean, so you, you ride them for a certain period of time and wherever you stop is wherever you stop. And um, I'm concerned about them being in the city of St. Louis, or in the, in the city of Brentwood, excuse me. Um, that's just my two cents. But I share your concern. I, you know, I could see these in some areas that might have a touristy attraction. I just don't see Brentwood two square mile city really needing scooters. I, I have the same feelings. I can see these in Clayton if someone wa is, is trying to get through, a business person is trying to get through the city, whether they move the car. That makes a lot of sense to me, just like it does in major cities. We're a small city. I don't think we need them. Um, coming off Metrolink, picking up a scooter and leaving it, Sounds like it opens the door to some behaviors you might not want. I, th I think it's more, in our city, a teenage toy, and I tend not to think we need them. Woman says. I just rode one once in Austin, and I almost broke my neck. So <laughs> I think they're dangerous. I mean, I'm too, I'm too old. I, yeah. like, that will the la be the last time, first and only yeah. time I ever rode one. I mean, I think they're dangerous. I mean, I think uh, all I see is like a, a teenager falling off of it or an adult who okay. thinks she's old, younger than she actually is, you know, breaking <laughs> hip. I mean, I, and I do think that they're, you know, my experience with downtown, that they do kind of clutter up yeah. the area, so. so. I'm taking it, so go ahead, I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead. I, I could add, from, from hearing in other cities the amount of traffic in the ER from these scooters has not doubled, but it has been a huge problem in the ERs. So they're not being used 
just for transportation or if they are, they're not being used safely. So that tends to make me worry about them. Um, so with that in mind, we have it on the table. We have it motioned and we have it seconded. Um, I'm gonna call for a vote and the vote is basically whether or not to recommend this to the full board for consideration. Roll call please. Uh, Alderman Plufka? No. Alderman Sims? No. Alderman Lockmiller? No. Alderman Ronio? No. Motion fails. Thank you. Um, we have a, uh, oh, we, we had this presentation at the last meeting, correct? This was uh, presented, the next item is the security plan? Yes, this was uh, presented at the last meeting. Um, I know we, there wasn't a whole lot of discussion at the time, so right. I think the idea was, did you want to open up for further discussion? Uh, again, knowing the fact that uh, we'll be bringing the personnel request to Ways and Means next month. So. And I believe the police department. I, I would make a suggestion about this. I, I thought the presentation, my own personal opinion, I thought the presentation was great, uh, very thorough and very well done. Um, but I my inclination would be to if the appropriate thing to do would be to table this until the August or even the September meeting, such that we would have that some personnel information and some stuff to really debate. I mean, there was a lot of recommendations made in that presentation, um, and it's gonna call on us to discuss those in detail. I'm not sure we're prepared to discuss them at this point in time. Um, if anybody disagrees with that, Tell me now, we'll have a conversation about it. Well, my um, question slash comment, I mean, some of the capital recommendations, I'm thinking, for example, like the, the ambulance-ish vehicle. I mean, do we order that and we get it in two years? I mean, I, and I'm wondering in terms of things that we need to set in motion now because we're not going to get them in three years or however long it takes. I mean, I, I, I mean on the one hand, I think that you know, I agree. I thought the presentation was you know, was you know very well put together and identified some serious you know things that we're going to need to onboard in our city. But in terms of timing, well, that's when, a, when that, do we need it? I mean, I yeah, that that's a great point. So, so maybe if you yeah, can speak I'll have to that. two comments about that. And the first is, as far as the capital, uh, the city is going to be working on our capital plan uh, coming up during the budget process. And so any capital items that need to be added as part of that presentation will be kind of put into the capital plan and figured out how we fund it and in what year we fund it. Um, I mean, there's some things that will rise to the top. I mean, we've heard about the radios already, so we have to kind of consider that based on all, you know, any lease we have, debt service we have, and really what leftover funding there is for capital projects. So. The whole idea of setting that five-year plan is to kind of give us a little bit of a guideline of how we do it. Uh, I think part of it will depend, and this is what we're figuring out now, we're, we're doing revenue projections now, at that point we can help put everything together and know how much capital funding we'll have. So again, not to keep throwing things to Alderwoman Sims and Ways and Means, but this will be a Ways and Means discussion. The secondary issue on that is I know a lot of what uh, Chief Spee said was that a lot of their capital uh, work, requests were based on the fact that they have the three officers to utilize those. So I think that goes along with the personnel discussion, which again, Alderwoman Sims gets the lead at Ways and Means. Right. Could I ask the chiefs just to weigh in just really quickly to say whether or not any of the capital expenditures are time sensitive enough that we should be taking them up in a meeting like tonight as opposed to 30 days from now? In other words, you know, are we, you know, because of the lead time for ordering things and getting them delivered, are we uh, hurting ourselves by delaying this? For the police department side, uh, the short answer is no. Everything that we have listed in this plan for capital is, as Eric said, is predicated on having people using them. So it really boils down to whether or not we have the people to use the capital items. Okay. When that discussion or how urgent that would be is uh, that's up to, I would assume that's going to go to Ways and Means. At this yeah, point. and we'll start that discussion in August. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the only other thing that I would touch on is the canine issue. Uh, that is a long path, but it also requires a canine officer who would be one of the three. So 
uh, as a capital item, there was a car included in that and some other things. But okay. I think that's that's almost a separate discussion uh, as opposed to this the okay. true uh, security capital items for the, the Brentwood bound area. Uh, Chief Cottrell, I'm sorry. No, absolutely. Um, kind of in the same boat, uh, nothing urgent this month. Um, we are looking at those projections right now. Um, we were working on equipment replacement schedules today. So, um, you know, the, the UTV being the priority for the Brentwood Bound project, um, we're, we're still working on it. We're, we're not ready to present that just yet. Okay. Um, yeah, lead time is a concern, but but I don't have that specific number on a that vehicle. I have a question. Yes. Um, I don't know protocol. If by any stretch of the imagination there is anything in the contingency fund left over from Brentwood Bound, can that be used for a couple of these vehicles to be used in the park? I, I honestly don't know the answer to that question. Um, I know that a, the current uh, 2019 COPS have very specific uh, requirements for funding. Uh, so I, I would have to make sure with Bola and uh, Kevin that capital purchases like that fit the requirements of the COP. Thank you. I too would rather see what our revenues are going to be coming in for 2023. Right. The whole global picture before I sign off on any of these and then I really, you know, we three of us sit on the 353 and we had a presentation. I've made a comment, you've made a comment that I think this master developer needs to put some skin in the game. And I think some of these items could be that skin. I absolutely agree with you. I, I think that, that, that that's a conversation that needs to go on simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, the last item on old business is the low speed vehicles and golf cart follow up. We have uh, uh, um, a okay. Um, we have an ordinance to that has a number of parts to it that is here for consideration. Um, I added, or I asked to be added, um, a section uh, earlier today that had to do with, so So the, the basic um, issues on this are that these vehicles are, um, are allowed by state statute, but but we are allowed as a municipality to restrict their operation within the city of Brentwood. Um, and so out of that framework, this collection of ordinances was uh, born. Um, I guess what I'd like to do is just start off, I, I wanna make one change and it was recommended um, by one of our citizens who uh, spoke during the um, the um, comment section and that is that of the four um, exceptions to the no operation on pathways uh, sidewalks or walkways um, section 340.265 D um, I made uh, an error in the way that I described um, number three within the one, two, three, four locations where we would allow both pedestrians and low speed vehicles uh, of this type to operate. And instead of saying on the northern end of Salem Road, west of Cecilia, what it should read, because that area west of Salem Road to Cecilia is too narrow for the operation of a golf cart. There's a couple of fences involved, and um, it was pointed out to me that that, that would, it wouldn't be really possible for a golf cart to, to drive through there. Um, it, would sh it would instead go east to Rosalie Litzinger, um, similar to where Lewis Avenue runs that direction. Um, that would be the only change I would 
point out just in terms of it being an error. Um, and so with that in mind, I open it up for discussion to anybody that wants to weigh in or how they want to weigh in. Alderman Sims. Um, and I had to I had to Google map this to sort of see what was um, what these areas were referring to. Um, I think that your suggestion is fine. I tend to agree with um, what the mayor said earlier in um, public comment that, and I don't know if it's an extra paragraph that there would be adequate signage and other you know striping is needed to uh, you know direct to indicate you know where uh, where this type of vehicle is allowed. Um, the other uh, question I had, and and it could be that I, we were speaking about this briefly earlier, that it could be that the, the reader, me, didn't read it correctly, and so I'll, I'll admit that. Um, but the part in uh, 340260, uh, paragraph C and D, I thought they kind of read in conflict with each other. That in paragraph C you say, state that um, golf carts uh, aren't permit as we define them, aren't permitted. And then in paragraph D, we say they are on pedestrian ways and streets substantially closed to vehicular access by government agencies for emergency public safety and so on. I, I, I just, the, reading those two paragraphs together confused me. And I, what, um, what was the, like what's the target we're trying to hit there? I, um, and maybe that can just be polished a little bit. I'll take a, um, a, a stab at it. I think that subsection C um, it describes streets, highways, where the speed limit is in, in excess of 30 miles an hour. And then at the end, it just it, it identifies those streets by name. Wait, this is this is three four uh, zero two six zero. Yeah, oh, two six zero. So Sorry. yeah, so this is on the beginning Sorry. of page two, and so there's oh. no. Um, right, it's a different. Okay, so th the okay. Subsection D, as I was made to understand, of section 260, yeah, subsection D, it describes a situation where the area involved has been, has been cordoned off, like a parade, as a for instance, or like a block party, where no vehicle traffic is being allowed for a period of six hours or a day or, or whatever, and in the situation where streets are substantially closed to vehicle access by governmental agencies for emergency public safety, administrative maintenance, construction, or similar public purposes, then it's okay to have a golf cart in those areas at that time. When vehicles are otherwise prohibited, we're going to allow you during the time of the parade or the block party or the public safety event or the emergency or whatever, we're going to allow transportation by golf cart in in that specific instance. That's what I understood that paragraph to refer to. Eric, do you have any thought on that? Is that? I know Dan did most of the work with Kevin on this. Um, like it's Brentwood days, and then you okay. have a golf cart and you're commuting, whether it's parks, public works, or an official, you can do that. That's correct why that was okay. implemented. I guess I'm more Is there a better way the, to do it, you think? Well, just the, the reference to pedestrian ways. I can't even, you know, on Brentwood days, we don't have golf carts. On sidewalks? Sidewalks. And we have ch small children waiting to be pelted with candy on, <laughs> small, on sidewalks. But, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not opposed. Like, the, the concept I'm fine with, I feel like there could be a better way to say it. Because I think that it is open to, you know, I mean, I... I guess I, I thought that that was maybe this more of a drafting approach or to maybe emphasize that like when it's a private event because the way I read that 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 concept flew over my head and that doesn't it's, and a, I'm, it's a double negative this specifically exempted from the prohibitions can that be rewritten so the statement is po positive and golf carts may be used 
whatever. That would make it much more In other words, clear. Right. In other words, exempting them from the prohibition, allowing them during certain circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think that's possible. I think we could try to figure that out. Um, is a concept I, that, that I'm yeah. fine with. Yeah. I figured that, that I figured they were trying to um, right. do something other than have two paragraphs in opposite to each other. Um, and so, if we, I mean, I'm not okay. Yeah, you know, maybe just maybe even if we just sort of s spelled it out what we mean. I mean, I yep. that, that would make that would certainly make me understand where we're getting at. And then um, the. Uh, Reference to, I don't know, where, where was it? Um, well, there was a statement about it earlier in public comment about uh, them not being allowed on oh. Litzinger. And how I read, and it was, and I, I actually, when I read that, I, that was another you know question I had, because I thought the way it read implied that somehow we didn't control that section of Litzinger, and do we, or is that a, t did the county take over? I mean, because if the county took over that section of Litzinger, we can't really, we, we're not allowed to have those vehicles know, on Dan, it, whether or, or not it was just. Litzinger is a. Well, part of it's, you know, Rock Hill. Part of it's Rock Hill, that's a good point. Yeah. So you don't own everything, because at South Side, you know, when you're first coming in, yeah. you know, Bremerton. So was that. Was it's in Brentwood on both sides, uh, east of Brentwood Boulevard. Correct. But it's not yeah. front one on both sides west of Brentwood Boulevard. That's true, especially in the area of McGrath until School. Until, until McGrath until School. Up to McKnight, no. Up to... No, like, like Bremerton. St. Clair. Bremerton. The north side um, is Brentwood all the way down. It's south side south from side Bremerton to McKnight, which is Rock Hill. Yeah. The sidewalk is on the north side. So now I'm understanding the prohibition, like why, I mean, an approach would have been just to not... A, but it's not as a, it, it was that why it was just prohibited or the, as written it was that you can't be on there because I think from issue. a previous meeting it was that early, or first responders use that and they don't want to be competing against a golf cart when you're trying to go to a fire and trying to get to McKnight to then go up to York or Whitehall. You know, you really don't want someone tooling along at 20 miles an hour in a low-speed vehicle when you've got a, a bigger burden to take care of. You know, that was why I thought it was included in there, but maybe we didn't understand it. If it was to be allowed, does that No, we don't want you on Litzinger with the low-speed vehicle, just that stretch between McKnight and Brentwood Boulevard. But it looks like... Let's but there is a Litzinger, you know, coming east of Brentwood Boulevard, which is fine because you can wind your way to Kentland and those streets. Right, but let's say, you know, just for argument's sake, a low-speed vehicle is allowed on... Woodsinger between Brentwood and McKnight. What's the implication of the Rockwood part? Are they allowed? I mean, they wouldn't be able to come back on Woodsinger. <laughs> Get a drive on the opposite like, side, like right. London. Yeah. Is that is that what would? That's part of it, I think. Uh, that is, I mean, they couldn't go east. They could um, go because they could go west to. Yeah. You know, if it was not prohibited, they could go west, but then they couldn't come. I guess you could go east back. if you're going through Rock Hill because we wouldn't control that side, you know. But I don't know what I don't know what they're. Yeah. Because you have the same issue with McKnight. I mean, we just prohibited it, but I mean, technically, we don't own that western half. That's Ladue. You know, from Forty all the way down to right. Litzinger. I I understand. Mr. Glass's question about crossing Litzinger, how mm -hmm. a cart could cross there safely. But given the turnoff into Walgreens and the credit union, there's a lot of traffic there, and I don't, I don't see a golf cart as being an asset to help that traffic at all. I don't have suggestions, but I, I can't see it on Litzinger, period. There was language in this that we removed that basically said you can't drive on a street where the speed limit's higher than 35, I think it was, not even 30. And then the right. previous language said that. and But then it also said except to cross mm -hmm. that street to get to another street, you know. Um, and I think that's part of what Dan's comment 
went to was you know, as a practical matter to be able to use the cart, you know, throughout, I guess, mm -hmm. the city of Brentwood, there'd have to be some allowance to at least cross Brentwood Boulevard. Right, you can cross point. perpendicular. Yeah, right. that's allowed. Okay. But my question, his question is if they can do it at Litzinger. Right. And I, that isn't safe. Well, you can always cross right. a street. I mean, right. pedestrian, I can walk across Brentwood, mm -hmm. but the, it's can you travel on right. the streets? You know, and that's the issue. I think the goal is to push people more towards Pine. You know, that's signalized too, and you can go east and west across Brentwood yeah. Boulevard. But Litzinger's just kind of a mess. You know, get that unprotected turn too. Like if you're going, what is it, westbound, and you know, there's not an arrow in some instances. And the eastbound. You yield to the left person turn. turn. Gets a lot of cars stacked up, and there's mm -hmm. always somebody who's rushing through on the yellow to get through, and yeah. it, it's. Well, um, in addition to rewriting 260D and then making that change in the mistake that I made in 265D, um, I, I really don't know. I don't know how to address the concerns. I, I understand what Mr. Glass brings up, and I think he, I think he brings up a... Um, a good point. I, I also understand all the all the woman O'Neill. I understand your concerns as well. I I don't know how that can be the boat. The, you know, I don't know. How do we reconcile it? I don't right. know. Right, reconcile. Pine is through. Right. To mm -hmm. So the so the tonight. the implication right. is to go all the way up to Pine, but then to get to Pine, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know enough about the Pine High School and high school back to right. uh, Lit Center or Pine where right. you can't go on McKnight. Right. Would it on the east side of it though, would it require you to go through Memorial Park to get to get to Pine? No. Can't be on stress. I mean I feel like like Bosco da Gama trying to get through like <laughs> the city of Brentwood. I mean I'm not doing a very good job of it before, <laughs> but yeah, right. how do you you know, can you otherwise go from east to west without using Litzinger? Get in your car and drive there. I mean, I know <laughs> I've, like, I've jogged <laughs> from Pine to Walk and push the pedestrian to, signal. Um, well, you know, we may just not be able to get everybody where they want to go in a, in a low-speed vehicle. I, so both Litzinger and Strassner are horrible intersections especially right now with the detour. I can't see a low-speed vehicle on those, either way, for safety. You mean sake. as they intersect with Brentwood? Yeah. Yeah. But as written, Strassner is a street they could be on. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Um, so let, let me recommend we do this. Let's um, bring this back up as old business for August, and in that time frame, uh, make an effort to rewrite Section D of two six of two sixty, in a in a less negative way, <laughs> in a more understandable <laughs> way, and then and then also to make the one change, with regard to uh, two sixty five D, um, and bring it up for consideration at that point, Steve. And then under two eighty okay. B, do we have to have like a procedure for getting your registration through Brentwood, the city of Brentwood? Yeah, when I talked to Kevin, the thing that we one it changed was under 34270 was removal of the compliance sticker and having the police. And so, because he said, you know, he didn't like having the police do it. He said, uh, I didn't recommend adopting an inspection program for these vehicles, but it's a cumbersome administrative burden and to avoid anyone being able to claim that the city anyway certified or approved one of these vehicles. Can we work on, do something with his yeah. microphone? It's not working. Like, I couldn't even understand what you were saying. <laughs> we're going to get a change out here. So, so they replaced that, that inspection with the 
there would be a registration, registration. and not a compliance. So instead of them inspecting, the person would just come in and register it just like you would, I know growing up in Illinois, you registered your vehicle, you yeah. registered a dog, you know, that way they had copies of the rabies tags and all that stuff. But right. in this case, you just want to make sure you knew who had them. So it's like if you registered it with the city, say there's 10 people that have them and so on and so forth. But the compliance and the inspection he did not like just because it puts a burden on them and then if they deem it safe and then some accident happens, well, you looked at my seatbelt or whatever. But the requirements are still in there. So it's like the safety equipment you do have to have on this low speed vehicle, whether it's turn signals, you know, headlights, taillights, all that stuff. He does agree that that's important. I mean, I, I, just to push back on that just for a second, I mean, I get my car inspected and I don't have the opportunity if I get into an accident to go and blame the people that inspected mm -hmm. my car. Um, I, I'm not sure I understand where that comes from necessarily. I mean, well, uh, anyway. I'm, I'm done. I'm okay. I do like the mayor's idea of paint on the on the trails. I've there. got that. I've got that on here. Is that we're there gonna, a way we can? We're going to talk that about that. I'm gonna, I don't know whether that needs to be in the ordinance. Oh, that's my question. But it could be in some sort of uh, language c accompanying the ordinance that says we're going to ask public works to provide adequate signage and paint the I mean I like a, I like the idea of a foot wide strip right across the, the trail and then have something going from there so it really catches the attention red paint <laughs> yeah I was thinking you definitely need signs because paint fades and in the fall you're gonna get leaves and I don't think that parks is gonna blow all the leaves off the trail I mean or pine needles or whatever I just know that yep like with ADA, you'll put the sign and you'll put the placard on the parking stall too, but typically they fade and you can still see the sign. Or if it snows, you know, if it snows, you're not going to see the striping. It snows, but, you shouldn't be out on the trail with that anyway. Well, I was going to say, you'll still see low speed vehicles, I'm sure, and there'll be but a couple let's inches do of both. snow. Let's paint and sign. Yeah, I would say you would do both, correct. Cool. And we'll, I'll, we'll make sure that it accompanies. Absolutely. Okay. Anybody else? I'm, I'm going to uh, hold that for old business in okay. uh, August Bring and get next. those changes. Um, new business, A, opportunity to partner with St. Louis County Police Academy. Thank you. Uh, we're asking for consideration on a, a topic that came up last week. Uh, the director of the St. Louis County Police Academy contacted me. Uh, they have an opening in their staff for uh, a position that's an instructor that would do training for both new recruits and active police officers. Understanding that there's about 58 municipal police departments in our area, and that represents hundreds of police officers. The man behind me, Nick Lang, was the one they wanted. I think that's a, a heck of an honor to Nick. Uh, it speaks to his expertise in law enforcement and his dedication to his job. Um, so what, what we're asking is consideration that Nick be assigned through a contract to St. Louis County. What that means, and you, um, you may have read this, but what that means is they're, they're responsible for everything for his pay and overtime and benefits. Uh, typically, these are multi-year arrangements. Uh, they don't want to have an instructor come over there and get good at what he or she does and then go bye-bye. So they typically stay years if they're good at what they do. So we would be missing Nick uh, here in Brentwood for that period of time, whatever that is. The challenge that, uh, that you'll see in, in this memorandum, the challenge for us is that we have to fill because we are very limited in officers anyway. Uh, Nick is on the street and we would have to hire someone and put him or her into Nick's position on the squad that he's on. Uh, that's actually a financial win for the short term for the city in that Nick is a top paid corporal. We would not be backfilling a corporal's uh, promotion process to fill his spot, we'll do that. Uh, with an officer on his crew, but uh, there is uh, the challenge of having to fill that spot with a police officer. We would have to hire someone to do that. Uh, really, I think the, the, the question that, uh, that all of you have to answer is what happens if Nick comes back? Uh, there will be a period of time there where we have a 21st officer on the street whose salary uh, will be responsible for until such time someone leaves the department. So it's an attrition thing at that point. That might be five years from now, might, we all might be retired and gone by the time that happens. Uh, and you know, I, who knows, Nick could retire out of there. How, how old are you, Nick? I'm 48, sir. 
He's 48, so he's got about seven years to go before he hits 55 to be retirement eligible. So that's the scenario here. Um, I'm asking uh, your consideration for this. This is uh, it's a little unusual in that uh, we're basically going over the Manning table, but we're actually saving money for the few years that, that we do it because of the entry level officer position. Uh, but we are putting ourselves in a position that if this doesn't work out for whatever reason, uh, we will have an extra officer at that point until someone leaves the department. Do you have any questions about that? It's a little complicated. Conversation with me, Steve. Yes, sir. Does there need to be some type of a formal agreement that, and I don't know how to write one, but I. Yeah. We have a contract from St. Louis County, blank contract for this, that they have, they have uh, other municipal officers that teach now in the academy. Uh, actually, the, the county captain that runs the, acad the academy was a municipal officer in Maryland Heights. He taught in the academy for numerous years. I think it was nine years. Uh, but there is a contract related to this. I have it. Uh, it's kind of a boilerplate contract that we can give to Mr. O'Keefe if this was approved. Um, I guess my, mine is more interested in when Nick does come back, mm -hmm. do we have to have some agreement now as to how he comes back and just, instead of just a handshake? You're talking about with the county? With us. With us. With employment here. Oh. Well, he would, he's, he would still be a, a Brentwood police officer. It's just that uh, oh, okay. it's similar to a task force position for the DEA that we used to have. It's, we don't do that anymore. Uh, similar to uh, Officer Figs with the school district. They pay 75% of Figs' salary. Uh, by contract, though, that, that can be terminated by either party, and he would return as a policeman here, potentially. So, so from a budgetary standpoint, the way this <clears throat> and the board, which should probably be looking at this, is that this is an additional officer. I mean, as you say, in the short term or even in the next three or four years, it may not be. But, but ultimately, it, you know. It could be. Uh, philosophically, they should be looking at it that way. They should certainly consider that, yes. Uh, okay. It could be that if Nick went six, seven years in the academy and retired, it wouldn't even be an issue. Right. Um, or well, we would, may have some some prior knowledge that it's coming. County might say, hey, it, in 2027, we're going to eliminate this position. So that year, knowing that, we could not fill a position that's open in that calendar year as well. Well, and not to get too far into the weeds, but what happens with regard to the next seven years? Of, let's say it happens for seven years and he retires from uh, active you know, duty as an instructor and takes retirement. Who has contributed to his pension for the last seven years? We have? Or to, is that St. Louis County? That St. Louis County's paying his salary. I, I assume it's <laughs> county. I mean, they're paying the whole package. Okay. Um, once he retires, then of course the city of Brentwood's on the hook for the for the pension piece of it. I understand, but it right. wouldn't have had seven years of contribution to it, though. Yeah, his total uh, package by contract would be paid by the St. Louis County. Okay. So I think the answer is St. Louis County. Any recommendations? No, I, th um, I think it's a great honor. Yeah, for it is a great honor. I think it is our loss as a city to have it is that as well. I will say that as well. Right. And I will say, uh, Alderman Woman O'Neill was a challenge for myself and Major Hawkins, because Nick does a great job for us. But I think it's there's there's value on the backside of this. Uh, we may get a position at the board uh, at the board of directors for St. Louis County Police Academy that directs the manner in which they train officers in our area. I think that's valuable. Uh, we'll have use of the, the gym, we'll have use of their virtual equipment that's in that memo uh, that's an officer safety uh, technology equipment the county has. He can get our policemen in there whenever we want to. So there, there's some back-end advantages for the city, and it's a reputation thing for Brentwood as well. It really is. There's, they are very hand-picked, as I said, and uh, having a Brentwood officer do this is, a, is a, an honor for him, but us as well. You can help identify candidates. Uh, Absolutely. Yes, sir. Future. Um, so I would entertain a motion that the city of Brentwood enter into a, a yearly contract with the St. Louis County Police Academy to have Corporal Nick Lang be detached as a St. Louis County Academy and Range instructor and that authorization be given for the Brentwood Police Department to hire an officer to replace Corporal Lang. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Is there for any further discussion? Roll call, please. Alderman Pufka? Yes. Alderman Sims? Yes. Alderman Locke Miller? Yes. Alderman O'Neill? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you.
luck. Good luck congratulations. and congratulations. All right, we're sorry I to lose not, you. I will not fail. <laughs> we have um, under new business B, the presentation of the fire department strategic plan. Good evening, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, share the information. I know this has been a long time coming, getting pushed off here and there, so. Right. Uh, there we go. Uh, loaded into your positions is the PowerPoint presentation. You have a copy of the uh, strategic plan as presented, and then also a supporting memo, memo from uh, Chief Cottrell. Um, I can field questions now, or we can do the PowerPoint presentation and then questions later and then go over uh, the plan line by line if you'd like. Um, I, I'll ask a question at this juncture. Sure. Uh, are you asking for this committee to up, up somehow approve this plan or recommend its approval to the Board of Aldermen? Or is it just a presentation to let the elected officials know exactly where the department is? Yes and yes. Okay. <laughs> yep. Informational. Okay. Um, the plan's implemented. It is at no cost other than through the normal budget process, like professional development. Yep. Um, so no formal approval, it's okay. informational. Thank you very much. With that in mind, are there any questions? Make your presentation. Okay, perfect, appreciate it. Uh, so page one, this is a uh, five-year plan, 22 through 26. Uh, the important part of this is that there were internal and external engagement. Uh, the external piece, um, as you know, I go across the country assessing other fire departments and through the accreditation process for fire, community risk reduction, standards of cover, and a strategic plan are important. Most of the strategic plans that we reject have no external input. So they don't go to the citizens, they don't go to the governance, they just talk about what would be cool or what they think they need and then they present the plan. So there was um, a very concerted effort for external stakeholder input. So the governing board got invited for input. We asked for residents from each of your wards for input. We went to the, for lack of a better term, the movers and shakers in the community, uh, prominent business owners, um, select citizens. We even queried some of our um, customers, people that have used our ambulance or someone's house that has caught on fire. So we got a very good cross section within the business community. We partner with um, the school district uh, with the churches, so we, I mean it was a 100% cross-section of everything that's going on here in Brentwood um, And we also engaged all the departments within the city. It was one of the uh, primary focuses when I first came in when Chief tasked me with facilitating a strategic plan uh, Because this is a municipality. Are there any other? Strategic plans within the other departments. How can we support that or are we a component of someone else's plan? So uh, we went through that process, and again, I believe that what we have in place here will support everything in the city. And that's really the goal here, is to make a great fire department and a great city that much better. So we started off, our fire department did not have a mission statement, we did not have a vision statement, and we did not have any type of a value proposition. So that was the majority of the work that I did. Um, internally, we asked, really, what is our mission? What, why do we exist? What is it that we do? and we broke it down into a very short and sweet phrase, we provide excellence through service. That's really the foundation of what we do. And our vision, we wanna be the leader, and you'll notice the is capitalized, bold, and underlined, because we wanna be the focus in this region. So we wanna be the leader in public safety through excellence in delivery and responsiveness for everyone. Not just people that we serve for 911, for someone that comes in and asks a question. When we're out on the street, Someone stops us. You don't have to be a resident. Okay, we serve the public. The public is everyone. Excellence in response, service to everyone. So the value proposition, we sent, this was all by anonymous survey. Um, we find that if you have to put your name on something, the responses aren't perhaps as rich, uh, and some of them appear to be watered down. Um, I'm happy to say that 95% of our employees signed their survey return. So that made it really easy to come up with uh, these values. Everyone gave responses. I put those responses into categories and then out of those categories asked everyone, hey, pick out a term that covers this. And the goal was we would like a mnemonic, something that's a little catchphrase that makes it easy to remember. And 
one of our captains and his crew came up with this sitting around the table at dinner one night. So it was like, hey, we are, we're a detail-oriented department. So they took those value proposition statements and made this mnemonic. So dedication is our strength. Excellence is our goal. Training is our passion. Accountability is our pledge. Integrity is our foundation. Loyalty is earned. And service is our calling. By using these value terms, our community is stronger because we're focusing these values because details matter. So details is our catchphrase for our strategic plan. Details matter. When we look at the strategic plan proper, in the center, the core, providing excellence through service guides everything else that we do. So we have six overarching initiatives that are in generalized categories. They cover safety, training, CRR, which is community risk reduction, that's a big piece of this plan, and it has a lot of tentacles on it, but it also gives us a massive opportunity to reach out into the community. Messaging is important. Professional development is a continuing value proposition for us, and then green initiatives as well. Um, the fact that we have more electric vehicles coming around, there is a, a shift in the viewpoint of how do we protect our protect our environment. There's ways that we can do that in public safety. Um, I was up in FDIC looking at new fire trucks back in uh, April, and there's an all electric fire truck. You can buy an all electric fire truck. I don't think a little bit south of two million dollars is the right thing to do. You don't want to be an early adopter for this type of technology, but we can certainly do battery powered rescue tools, which is the wave of the future now light, cheap to operate, same. So there's opportunities there. There's a lot of forecasting and outward looking vision to see how these components of this plan work together. Okay. So that is essentially the presentation, the overarching. If you would like to go through any details proper within the uh, strategic plan, I'd be more than happy to discuss those with you. Anybody have any questions? Okay. Um, I was looking at these objectives, uh, Ed, and um, objective 1C, mm -hmm. uh, regarding mental health awareness, mm -hmm. are there certain stresses inherent to the, the profession that you need to be lo watching for? Is that what this category is? Or? Yeah, essentially. So over the years, there's been a, a pendulum shift in how we deal personally with what we see every day. It's no secret that when we're called for service, we're usually seeing people at the worst possible moment of their life. We've been at the highs and we've been at the lows. The old culture was just shake it off and you know, you're just gonna have to you know, toughen up. Um, that causes some issues later on. Some people do not have the coping skills for it. Uh, there was also um, almost a push back to not talk about it in the firehouse because that would show a sign of weakness. Those are all bad for our industry. We, we want people talking. We want people reaching out for help. Help is available, but you have to reach out for it. But I also want to empower our employees to don't be afraid to speak up and approach someone and, and talk with them about it. My previous employment, I, I have experience with this. Um, I believe that if we hadn't reached out and talked to a couple guys, it would not have, the, the outcome would not have been as successful as it was. So that's essentially what this is. We, we want to stay current on the research that says what are best practices within the industry, what can we do to help our own folks, and if maybe we have to modify a practice. Maybe we offer something in EAP. Um, touch therapy is a big thing right now. Um, I am not opposed to bringing a dog into the firehouse. Everybody, you know, a dog in the firehouse, everybody loves dogs. I mean, look at the press we got yesterday by saving 42 dogs. I mean, we, we took them in the kennel as they passed them out the door and put them in the boat. We had trouble keeping the Labradors in the boat because they wanted to jump out and swim. But, uh, you know, dogs are good for us. Uh, touch therapy. So we can partner. This is one of the uh, partnership opportunities in the community. Animal Protective Association, they've offered, hey, if, you know, you guys can come up or we can bring somebody in, have a pet session, doesn't matter. These are the things. Um, a lot of these objectives in here are tied to each other. They're mutually supportive, but that's essentially what we're talking about there is 
mental health needs to be forward looking. We, need, we know it exists. We know there are issues with it. We want to address these here and take the opportunity to make offer to our employees what need to be offered. And then um, the one, objective 3A, are you guys having a hard time finding training facilities? Is that what that is addressing now? We have, uh, we have signed a contract with West County to use their burn facility. Uh, now again, we're taking units out of service and driving out to the city of Manchester to spend a half a day for a training. Uh, we also partner with St. Louis City. It's a little bit closer, but it's still resources out of the region to accomplish um, acquired structure training. Yes, it would be beneficial for us to have a dedicated training facility. I would love to have it in Brentwood, but somewhere in this region so that our training partners, we have something closer. And it's not such a burden on responses. We, we will never miss a call because of training. It might take us a little bit longer. You may be getting one of our mutual aid partners. But having a dedicated training facility that we can help design that meets our needs and what we project for the future is the ideal state. That's the desired state where we would like it to be. And then I like the, the one um, where you're in, more engaging, with, uh, let's see, it'd be 4D, more engaging with the public. I know with COVID that's been hard to do, but there used to be activities at the firehouse. Mm -hmm. And I, I see that maybe you'll be meeting with the, uh, up at the schools. Yeah, so the, the, the school piece is big. Um, I know, I view it as an opportunity. Where I came from, we had two school districts and all of the um, faith-based schools to deal with. Uh, it was a scheduling nightmare. But we did it. Here we have one school district and then just a couple of the faith-based. So it's an opportunity to get really up close and personal with the staff and with the students. So those are the public education and public relations opportunities. We want to be in the schools more, not just for show and tell. Show and tell is cool, but we also want to have an education and a curriculum component. Every time we're looking at each touch that we have with a student as an opportunity to give education, not just, hey, here's the cool fire truck and here's what it's like to wear our turnout gear. Yes, that will still happen, but there needs to be some message with that as well. And it'll be tailored to the age group. So that's the, that's the big leverage piece that we have with our new fire marshal, is that he's gonna be doing a lot of that stuff. I think that would be good. You know, you've got a senior looking for something to do after graduation. Mm -hmm. I mean, being right out there in front and helping with the recruitment. Yeah, we, uh, we're open to any opportunities. And again, it, it, we'll try anything. If it works, great. If not, we'll mark it as a lesson learned. And, We'll move on to the, to the next big piece, the next shiny object, whatever you want to call it. But I, I really view us as a solution. Collectively, our fire department, we're a solution looking for a problem. Uh, we want to be out in the community where we want to, we're your fire department, so what is it that we can do for you within reason? I'd just like to say I, I'm impressed with your time frame. You've obviously spent a lot of time with this and going into 2024, you can, we can see that you, you really do have a plan set there. So I commend you for everything that you've detailed and how well you've planned. Uh, some of the timelines are a little ambitious um, and that's, you know, all of the dominoes have to fall in place. But um, at, in 26, when we go to review and renew this, I've seen several plans where this is an ongoing proposition and no secret, some, a lot of this is tied to uh, funding. So if we can't get funding, we'll try to figure out a way to do it, but it may be transition into the next version of the plan, which is okay. Um, a lot of this stuff won't be on there, but there, there may be some stuff that's hanging over and that's okay, that's all right. <laughs> Only that I, I, I I can tell a lot of work went into this, and I can, I mean, I think that the vision and the mission statement and the, I love that acronym, I, I mean, and the, the goals are impressive, so I, I think that this is well done and certainly something I'm proud of. I hope we can put the, if it's not up there already, to make the um, presentation available on our city website so people can have ready access to it. But yeah, well done. Thank you very much. Thanks, appreciate the time. Um, section 10 is citizen comments. We revisit citizen comments and invite anybody here in the audience or online to make a comment with regard to public safety issues in the city of Brentwood. You'll be given three minutes. We have no one in there. 
Thank you. I will close citizen comments and seeing no additional business on the agenda, I declare this meeting adjourned.